On March 22, 2014, a search party stumbled onto an overgrown property in an underdeveloped part of Ibadan, Nigeria. The place was in derelict condition. Rusting construction equipment sat abandoned in the brush. The search party pushed onward until they found a building. There were voices inside. What they found that day was a nightmare, something terrifying and surreal. We know they found people in chains, skeletal from starvation. We know there were decomposing bodies in the bush. Human bones were in the well outside. We know a starving man died even as his would-be rescuers arrived to save him. We know that several rusting storage containers on site held shoes, bags, and clothes. Remnants of living and breathing people who were here once but were long gone now. This is what we know about the 2014 Horror House of Ibadan, Nigeria. If you've heard this story before, you will realize key details are missing. This is about human sacrifice, isn't it? This is about ritualists kidnapping people to sacrifice for profit. That is what the local police say. Much of the Nigerian media coverage agrees. So where's the problem? The problem is, based on my research, this isn't a story about human sacrifice. This is a story about ableism, corruption, and a failure of accountability. It is a story about what happens in a society that sees some people as less than human. Nobody knows what happened to Kazim. The fate of the missing man who led to the discovery of the house is one of the strangest parts of this whole story. Back in 2014, when Kazim disappeared, kidnappings were commonplace in Nigeria. By 2015, a security official acknowledged 108 kidnappings in the previous month alone. These were overwhelmingly for ransom. This is a country with high rates of poverty and economic inequality. For some poor Nigerians, kidnapping was a way of making money. For others who had money, it was a way to finance a way of life they felt they deserved. So Kazim's case was odd. There was no ransom demand. Instead, his friends got a phone call. It was Kazim. He had been kidnapped. He was being held underground with eight other people. He didn't know where, but he had an idea. This search party, described as a hundred men strong by police, would find the horror house. Kazim's motorcycle was reportedly abandoned in the Ogunpa River, but Kazim himself was gone. Calls no longer made it through. Searchers found no tunnels, bunkers, or underground structures on the site. To this day, what happened to him remains a mystery. On site, authorities rescued survivors and arrested suspects, security guards from a nearby building. Talking to a local paper, a guard named Abedin Nakanmu admitted his involvement. He'd been hired by a man named Badamosi to watch over the horror house inmates. The people brought in were dirty looking, he said. Quote, we would bring them and shave their heads. But why? Akanmu believed Badamosi was working for the government. And the thing is, he might be right. In 2011, Obiela Ajimobi became governor of Oyo State. As the state's capital, Ajimobi had a clear vision for Ibadan's future. He launched an aggressive urban renewal program, keen to earn Ibadan a place on the global stage. These beautification efforts reimagined the city and reconsidered who deserved to live there. That meant removing low-income people like street vendors and waste pickers from public spaces. Fast forward to 2014. Ajimobi addressed a roiling crowd. Riots had followed the discovery of the horror house site. One pregnant woman was shot dead by police. Word from police was that ritualists had used the site for at least 10 years. Ajimobi's arrival on site had done little to soothe the public's anger. We were informed that you, the residents, did not know what was happening here, Ajimobi said. As you did not know, so we too did not know. If you who live in the neighborhood did not know, how then can we who live far away know? But people did know. In fact, people told the police. Here's what we know about the history of the site. Much of this comes from government critic Ayodele Adigun, a member of the opposition. He had worked in government for many of the 10 years human sacrifices supposedly took place. According to Adigun, a construction company bought the property in 1996. 
the company had been hired to turn the adjacent Agunpa River into a navigable canal. When they failed to deliver the expected results, a new company was brought in. Arigun was responsible for the canal project for the state government at the time. When the second company failed, he made a fateful decision. The state would claim the land and any abandoned equipment until such time the company returned the state's money. By 1999, the property was in state hands. From there, he tracks the state use of the property across the years. Between 2005 and 2011, the property was a sewage treatment plant. During this time, the state recorded annual revenue earned from the plant. Adigun points to this revenue to discredit the idea ritualists had been on the site for a decade. For years, this was an active, productive work site. By 2012, the sewage treatment plant had shut down. Complaints about the smell. It was that summer that Adigun claims the Oyo State Government contracted Messrs. Colifel Company Limited for a new initiative. The project to oversee, quote, the evacuation of lunatics from Ibadan and its environs would be run by consultant Ibrahim Badamosi. This program would be one more part of Ajimobi's broader urban renewal initiative. To ensure everyone was on the same page, Adigun continued, the Commissioner for Environment and Habitat wrote a letter explaining the project and its purpose to the police. Now, Abiela Ajimobi became governor in 2011. By the time Badamosi was hired, Adigun was out of government. You may ask, not unreasonably, what proof does he have of these incendiary claims? For the details, there isn't any. But the broad strokes of his story are documented in a news article from 2013. In a surreal interaction, a reporter challenged men seen snatching mentally ill people off the streets of Ibadan. They were from the Ministry of Environment and Habitat, they claimed, something the government later confirmed in a statement to the paper. Troublingly, the men told the reporter they would bring their prisoners to a camp at Soka Boluaji on the Lagos Ibadan Expressway. That the horror house was located in the Soka forest area adjacent to the Lagos Ibadan Expressway will probably not surprise you. In an op-ed, a government spokesman denies all this. Instead, he argues the contractors had a humanitarian agenda. They had been hired to reunite the destitute with their families, he said. The Oyo state government had even received a letter of thanks from its counterpart in Lagos for their reunification efforts. What the actual intentions of the relocation program were, I don't know. The House of Representatives of Nigeria commissioned a report on the horror house ordeal, but I can't find it. My emails to Nigeria's National Assembly bounced. That's the sentence I never thought I'd have to say. So, lacking concrete details, we are left with survivor accounts and stories from local residents to fill in the gaps. What that reveals is a story that seemingly tracks closely with the forced displacement narrative. Locals interviewed claim that two years before, residents reported the site to police after four men in chains escaped across the river. There, they were told the site was government operated and focused on the treatment of the mentally ill. Police would later deny this claim. One security officer from a nearby residential area described visiting the site and meeting Badamosi. He was told the same thing, and even saw the prisoners and the conditions in which they lived. But Badamosi reassured him that everything that happened there was legal. He showed the man documents proving his connection to the Ministry of Environment. Meanwhile, survivors often described their kidnappings as being forced into a vehicle. One woman described her kidnapping as an arrest. She had broken some law, she was told, apparently just by standing in her own front yard. Others who were kidnapped were selling their wares in the street, while others were simply traveling. Once taken to their jungle prison, they faced violence and neglect. Food came once a week. The palm oil and rice they were given to eat was so bad as to be almost inedible. People starved to death. Mental illness and how it's viewed in Nigerian society hangs over this whole story like a dark and horrible cloud. There are reports that survivors all experience some form of mental illness, but that seems almost irrelevant. It seems unlikely that Badamosi's goons chose their targets based on anything more than gross stereotypes. I don't have specifics for Oyo State, but in Imo State, further south, one survey shows belief about mental health heavily shaped by superstition. 
developmental disabilities could be the work of witches, or curses from the gods, or the result of breaking cultural taboos. Now, one academic paper from a different state doesn't speak for all Nigerians, but even reading Nigerian coverage of the Horror House case, the stigma against mental illness is clear. Remember how those people reported the four men in chains who escaped across the river? They went to the police not out of fear for the men's safety, but because they believed the men and the other prisoners held at the site were mentally ill and therefore dangerous. It's a lot. So by this point, there's one big question remaining. Why ritualists? Human sacrifice has a place in any number of cultures, but none of the survivor accounts I've seen have mentioned ritualists or sacrifices. Is it possible ritualists seized the site after Badamosi started his relocation program? I mean, maybe. But the idea of ritualist activity in Nigeria, at least how accusations play out in the press, is wrapped up in clear cultural dynamics I am in no way qualified to explain. I want to be transparent. I'm an outsider here. This is a perspective based on news reports, not lived experience. But based on my research, this is the best explanation that I can find for why the ritualist explanation was adopted so quickly and thoroughly in the local press. Days after the horror house was discovered, crowds converged on a man in Ibadan. He was a ritualist, the crowds determined, but was, quote, disguised as a lunatic. The man survived his run-in with the mob and was arrested. Papers reported he was carrying 25 human tongues. Police, to their credit, were more cautious. The tongues needed to be tested to see if they were human. They were sausages. The man was one of the lucky ones. Jungle justice, as the papers call it, taken against purported ritualists is a seemingly commonplace activity. Police often do try to intervene, but are themselves met with violence. Some of these so-called ritualists survive their brushes with mob justice. Others die. We cannot know whether any of those accused were criminals, much less actual ritualists. But in many circumstances, the line separating a ritualist and a homeless person with a mental illness seems imperceptible. In one example, the papers reported finding dismembered body parts inside a ritualist's den, a place that police would later describe as a simple homeless person's camp. The body parts? They never existed. But where did this come from? This fear underpinning the idea of the disguised ritualist, that someone is faking mental illness to hide their sinister intentions, seems very specific. Then I learned about Clifford Orgy. Orgy may not be the first example of this phenomenon in Nigeria, but he is unquestionably the most memorable. Simultaneously a shaman, cannibal, and serial killer, Orgy faked madness to avoid suspicion. He was arrested in 1999, but his impact on the Nigerian psyche remains widely felt. His lesson to the Nigerian people, that the strange man under the bridge may not be what he appears, has had deadly consequences for some of Nigeria's most vulnerable. Confronted with the bodies, with the horror of the horror house, ritualist activity is a conveniently digestible explanation. The fear is already there. The pump is already primed. Even today, articles that acknowledge the mental illness angle assume some role for ritualists in the horror house's abuses. This despite the fact it happened again. And again. And again. The horror house is unusual in the sense that the state government is alleged to have some role in its atrocities, but it is not unique. In 2019, based on a tip, police raided the Ahbad bin Hanbal Center for Islamic Teachings in Kaduna State. The exact number rescued varies by source, anywhere from 190 to 500 people were freed in the raid. The youngest rescued there was between five and nine years old. The center was supposedly focused on Islamic education and adult rehabilitation. Teachers claimed that families brought children in wards willingly, quote, to be trained or healed of their waywardness. What actually waited them was chains and starvation, with some survivors reporting sexual abuse and torture. Years earlier, in August 2016, 
police rescued 15 adults and 13 children in another, quote, healing center at Okeira in the nation's capital of Lagos. These abuses shock, but they should not surprise. And that's what we know. The story of the horror house of Ibadan, Nigeria, defies all attempts at easy characterization. Whether it's a horror movie or a systemic policy failure ultimately depends on who you believe. But regardless, I wish I could say people paced consequences for this. People like that guard, Abedina Kanmu, were arrested, but to my knowledge, Badamosi was never found. Politically, there were no consequences. Abiola Ajimobi died in 2020 of COVID-19. The horror house was not even a footnote in his legacy. And yes, the state government did try to demolish the site before a forensic investigation was completed. I've had to cut a lot of detail for time, but all my sources are included with the described script of this video, linked in the description below. Thank you for coming on this dark and terrible journey with me. This channel tries to take a fresh look at sometimes troubling material. If you have suggestions for subject matter, let me know in the comments below.